would rise, cry out to worship Whose glory time the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to say But this joy is mine Good morning, church here in Shineforth, uh, church here, uh, church there in the sanctuary. And also those who are uh, online, 
Uh, if you are online and you are uh, visiting us and uh, finding out more about us, we welcome you and pray that this uh, service ministers to you and that you come and join us uh, physically soon. And if uh, you are a member and you are uh, away, that's why you're online, uh, we pray that you will keep safe and be safe. And if you're unwell, uh, we pray that you will be well soon. Come, let us pray as we prepare um, to hear God speaking to us today. Our God of creation, our Lord of revelation, as your people gather today to hear your word, reveal to us your grace, reveal to us your truth, above all, reveal to us yourself. By the power of your Spirit, in the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Today's passage, Acts 2, is uh, familiar to many of us and, um, and we have read selected part, parts of it and uh, I will be sharing from selected parts um, because that's you know, the time we have um, to, to, to uh, dwell deep in it. But really, Acts 2, uh, the major portion of it is a sermon by the Apostle Peter, right? Um, and it refers to the prophecies of Joel and a prophecy in, in the book of Psalms. Um, but we will be touching uh, the whole uh, of Acts here and there, but we'll be focusing on certain parts of it for today. So I'm not going to talk about and focus on uh, what um, some would usually do. That is that, that powerful uh, manifestation of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Though significant uh, it was, the rushing wind and the tongues of uh, fire, uh, that will be the, not the emphasis today, right? But I do need to point out um, that the tongues of fire, verse 3, were recorded as having separated, right? It's very specific, right? The tongues of fire that came were actually separated and rested on each of the disciples. Now, this <coughs> is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, Right? And it is also a fundamental doctrine of the New Covenant. Remember, Pastor Ben preached on New Covenant on watch, uh, during Watch Night. Um, that everyone who calls on the name of Jesus shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everyone. And that's why the tongues were separated and given to each one. Well, let's turn to our neighbour and ask this question. Does the Holy Spirit live in you? Yeah, just ask your neighbor and see what's the response. Yeah, what was your answer? Yes, maybe, don't know, right? You see, <clears throat> in Romans 8 9, Paul tells us that you know, we are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in us. And anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. I hope your answer was yes. Right? And a resounding yes. The Holy Spirit, who was poured out on Pentecost, exactly 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, is the Spirit who lives in each and every believer today. I hope and pray the Holy Spirit is a reality for all of us. We don't just know right, in our heads, that the Holy Spirit lives in us, but we experience His presence in our hearts and in our everyday life, in every aspect of our life. The Holy Spirit lives in us, works in us and through us. <clears throat> now verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this is another spectacular sign of the first Pentecost, where each of the apostles were given the ability to proclaim mighty works of God, verse 11, right? They proclaimed mighty works of God in a language that, did, that they, they didn't take during their PSLE, right? So they don't know this language, yeah? But they were given 
right? The ability to speak that language. Now, this sign of the tongue or tongues has led to many debates and I do not intend to go there. But here's uh, what we need to know. Three things, right? Fire, right? Fire is regularly used to describe the presence and power of God. For example, the burning bush and the pillar of fire in the book of Exodus, right? So take note of the fire, the significance of the fire, the presence and the power of God. And it is no, secondly, it is no coincidence that the tongues of fire on the disciples resulted in the tongues of proclamation, right? The proclamation by the disciples, Right, the tongues of fire on the disciples resulted in the tongues of proclamation by the disciples. And there's no mistake in this. This is um, a clear sign that God wants us to, to, to realize that the tongues, that why, did the, why did the fire look like tongues? Do you realize? Have you, not like noses or ears or eyes, but tongues of fire. It is to, to relate to what happened later that the tongues of fire led to the tongues of proclamation in the, na- the languages of various nations. And thirdly, right, what we need to know is that what happened on this day was a fulfillment of what John the Baptist has declared, right, recorded for us in Luke 3.16. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sanders I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Right? Therefore, to, the main truth to take away from this first part of uh, Acts chapter 2 is this, and I've summarized it for us. God has fulfilled His promise of the Spirit to all believers, not only for Jews, but for all nations. This is the significance of the tongues as God's power and instrument for sharing the good news of the kingdom to every tribe and tongue. Now, but there is more to the Spirit's coming than the tongues of fire and the tongues of men. The Spirit, as the rest of the chapter shows, has come to build a new people of God where each old barriers of race, language and culture will be broken down. The Spirit, in short, has come to build the church. To build the church of Jesus Christ. And so the church began with the Spirit. As mentioned earlier, what happened in Acts 2 was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy found in the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and others. But, the idea of Pentecost, which really means 50, right? Penta, no, five. Pentecost, 50, right? Comes as early as the book of Exodus. This is important, right? In the book of Exodus, Pentecost is known as the Feast of Weeks, W-E-E-K. Feast of Weeks, or it's also known as Feast of the Harvest. It is a time where Israel brought before the Lord the first fruits. Right, of their spring harvest. Yes, first fruits. That's what happened in Acts 2. It is a time of first fruits. The main thing, really, as we read Acts chapter 2, the main thing is not the spectacular coming of the Spirit, though um, significant and important it was. It's not about the wind, the fire, and the tongues, but rather it was about the first fruits. Right, Pentecost is about the first fruit, the harvest, right, of souls through the power of the Spirit, through the preaching of God's word by Peter. And so you see Peter preaching, right, verse 14. Uh, and he, you know, he raised his voice, addressed his, the cry, and preached for the first time in his life. And then later, on, later down, you see in verse 41, the result. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 believers. These were the first fruits, right, of the harvest of the gospel of Jesus Christ at the first Pentecost. And with this, the New Testament church began. So that's point one. 
Point two, the historical witness, right? The church's historical witness through the Spirit. Now, remember what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 9. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Pentecost. Well, the harvest began 2,000 years ago on Pentecost, right? During the Feast of Weeks, during the Feast of Harvest. And this harvest continues today. And we, Barkerot Methodist Church, with the rest of the New Testament Church, are workers in this harvest field and witnesses, witnesses by the power of the Spirit. Now, Peter told his hearers in his, this first sermon that this Jesus God raised up and of, of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Now, this passage is significant in many ways. But here's one of the key idea in this passage. Here Peter spoke of the relationship between receiving the Holy Spirit and becoming God's witnesses. And really, this is something that Peter has learned from Jesus just 10 days before this day, which is recorded for us in Acts 1.8. Come, let's read this together, shall we? One, two, three. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, these words are certainly not only for Peter and the first disciples. No way could they have reached the ends of the earth. These words are for all of us, those who would become part of the great harvest of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might be wondering, why did I entitle this second point the church's historical witness. Because the word historical is very important for us Christians. Because we witness not to a legend, a fairy tale, or a myth, but to the historical reality of Jesus Christ, who lived, who died, who was raised from the dead, right? In Jerusalem around AD 35 or thereabouts. The nation of Israel is a fact of history. It's historical. It is still here today. Although the devil tried very hard throughout history to exterminate it. And the Bible that we are reading from today, it is a historical document. Just consider the New Testament with its account of the life of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. No, this document would not have survived the Roman Empire and the first century if not, if it is not historical, if it is not true, it will not survive. It will not last for 2,000 years until today. It would have been like all the you know, thousands, if not millions of other documents during that time, it would have faded out. But no, it has stood the test of time because it was historical and true. And finally, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit is also a fact of history. And this work, we call the church. And so today, as you sit here worshipping as the church, as Bark Road Methodist Church, you are witnessing to a historical reality that began in Acts chapter 2. By the Holy Spirit, the church was born and never stopped growing. Despite deadly and persistent persecution for the past 2,000 years, even today it continues, the persecution, but it keeps growing. By the Holy Spirit, the Christian church has done more than any other institution in history to bring about justice and human flourishing. Yes, the church has been a blessing. It has blessed the world through education, through medicine, through scientific discoveries and social economic transformation. 
You don't believe this? You can go and do some serious research of what the church has done for the world since the first century. The church has been imperfect, has made many mistakes, but the church has done a lot through the power of the Spirit, right? For the salvation of this world, for, as a blessing to the nations. Even this whole thing about human rights that those who don't believe in God today champion. Human rights began with the church because the church believes in Genesis chapter 1 that God made everyone in His image. And today, the Holy Spirit continues His work in the hearts of men and women, bringing them to faith in Jesus Christ and into a life of love, joy, peace, and hope. This transforming work of the Holy Spirit is a fact of history, and we are witnesses. You and I are witnesses of this reality. We are historical witnesses by the Spirit. Thirdly, we are to be the Spirit for the church as it was in Acts chapter 2. Now we saw earlier that 3,000 became Christians and were baptized. Yes, all Christians were meant to be baptized. Right? They became Christians after Peter preached to them God's word. This was the first official New Testament church, New Testament mega church of 3,000. Now, note that at the end of the chapter, we notice that the witness, right, the witness of this church was so powerful that it is recorded for us that they found favour with the people around, with Jerusalem the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And with that, the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. And the next time the church was counted again, right, in Acts 4, it became 5,000, right? It became 5,000 strong. And this is only counting men, right? We don't know why they're only counting men. Not very fair, right? Yeah. But that was how they counted last time. So it could be 10,000, it could be 15, 20,000 who came to Christ by that time. So the question here is, why was the witness of the church so effective in reaching the lost? Put differently, what did the Holy Spirit do amongst these new believers that made their lives so attractive to others? Well, here's what Luke documents for us. They devoted themselves now this is, so Luke is here describing the early church, what they were doing, their lives. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, which became the Gospels that we have today in, in our Bible. And the fellowship, they were devoted to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, was, was these activities what made them so appealing? that they regularly attended Bible study, that they gathered for worship and prayer, and that they ate and drank together? Well, in a way, these are just activities, religious activities. Now, in the first century as it is into, as today, there were all sorts of religions offering all kinds of activities. But what was so special about this one? We read on. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now we are coming to the crux, right? This can only be the work of the Holy Spirit, a sense of God's holy presence amongst His people, and of course the miracles of healing and demon casting that was done now by the apostles that were done earlier by Jesus Himself when He was with them. And he was actually training them for this. Now, Here's what I find intriguing. Instead of elaborating on the signs and wonders, we want to know, oh, what did they do? Luke doesn't go there. Luke goes on to write about how the new believers showed care and love to one another. Verse 44. 
And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling his, their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. No, you have to understand this, right? Uh, for the gospel writers, and I think especially for Luke, in his style of writing, right? He is very concise. Um, he doesn't waste words on anything unless it's worth documenting. And, and one of the reasons, you know, last time uh, writing materials were, were very expensive. It's not like now we can write, 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 then throw away, or we type, 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 then we delete, right? Last time, you know, it's ink and, and parchments and all that, they were really expensive. So they don't want to waste words, um, space in that manner. So whatever they write down must really be important and something they really want to say. So why did Luke write about this? He put, you know, two lines just to describe this. In fact, he, he repeats this and expands on it in chapter 4. Later, we'll, we'll look at it soon. Why did Luke bother to document this in his description of a spirit-filled church, the early church? Because such a behaviour is not normal. Right? It's not normal. Whether it was 2,000 years ago or in 2023, it is not normal for people to willingly sell possessions and property so as to, to help strangers in need. Will you do that? Will you sell your condo and your property uh, just you know, in order to do that? Now here, here looks this uh, elaboration in chapter 4. Come, let's, let's read again together God's word, shall we? One, two, three. Now all those who believe were of one heart and soul. And no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds and distributed to each as they had need. Is this normal behaviour? Normal human behaviour? No, give a little donation here and there, that's fine. Give a little more than usual. That's fine too, especially if it comes with 250% tax deduction. Right? No, this is not normal. Right? This is not normal. It is not normal for sinful and selfish humans to be generous. That's why big donors are often highlighted in the media. Because it's rare, especially if they give a large proportion of their wealth away. What we have here in Acts 2 and 4 is not philanthropy, right? It's not um, what, you know, billions air do. Rather, it is about the miracle of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of men to make them into generous people. Generous just like God. It doesn't matter if they, they were rich or not. It is about the transformation of the heart by the Spirit and by the Gospel. Perhaps Luke was telling us, right, in both his depiction of the church in Acts 2 and Acts 4, that the acts of supernatural generosity was also signs and wonders. Right, examine this um, later on. Um, you probably won't have time to do this, but examine these two texts later and you realize this that Luke interposes miracles done by the apostles with these miracles of generosity, right? He puts them both together because both are signs and wonders. Both are acts of the Holy Spirit. And so to answer my earlier question, this, right, is why the early church was so effective in reaching the lost. This was what made their witness so attractive their faith so appealing. Their lives were so distinct in, the, in, in this pagan world that people figured that this God must be real after all. There was something different about their fellowship, which I'll come to shortly. Yes, our God is real. Our God is historical. Our God is is real and he's still working powerfully today in our lives. His spirit lives in us. 
The question is, do we witness to this reality in our daily lives? We have seen that the church of Jesus Christ is historical and true. But is our faith just as true? We have seen that the Holy Spirit came upon every believer in the early church. But is the Holy Spirit a reality in our lives? No, Acts 2 describes 3,000 believers living as a people filled with the Spirit. And we are told that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. And the key word here is devoted. It's not just doing the activities, but devoted to them because of their devotion to God. No, these, are, these, peop- these were 3,000 strong church. We are a 3,000 strong church. But what is our devotion like? Are we also devoted to God? in our lives. This is what our faith is up is about, isn't it? A single-minded, a full-hearted devotion to the God whom we say we believe in. This devotion is not about outward piety, but a deep commitment to follow Christ by the power of the Spirit. I have decided to follow Jesus. He is our only reward. And I want to submit to you today as I close that such devotion is not possible apart from a devotion to the fellowship. Right? Apart from a devotion to the, the fellowship, the koinonia, as Pastor Wendy, Wendy has taught us some time back. Why? Because in the fellowship, there is accountability. Only in devotion to our fellowship, in the fellowship, will there be accountability, which is so important for the reality of our faith. Now, someone is going to notice in the fellowship if our devotion is deficient, right? Someone is going to expose us if we are hearing but not doing, if we are social but not sacrificial, and if we are just superstitious instead of truly spiritual. Someone is going to notice if we are truly devoted to the fellowship, if that devotion is deficient. Friends, are we devoted to the fellowship and especially to this fellowship that God has brought us into, Barkerot Methodist Church? Are we devoted to this fellowship? Do we really consider one another sisters and brothers You know, we call each other, oh, sister, brother. Are we really devoted to one another? Right? No, we are a very family church. It seems to me that almost everyone is connected to someone in this church uh, by birth or by marriage. Is it true? Yeah? Now, that's not a bad thing. Natural families, family ties are good because they are from God. But we are more than a family of flesh and blood. Right? We are more than a family of the flesh. We are a family of the Spirit. We are a family of the Spirit, birthed by the Spirit. We are a church. Right? We we are a church. We are not a clan. Right? A clan of extended families with with all its privileges and and, and benefits, we are not a clan. Even though we offer phase 2B, 2A, you know, and all that for schools. We are not a clan, right? We are a church. and, And we are not a fraternity. We are not a fraternity of doctors or business leaders or civil servants and so on. Yeah. We are not here for networking. Networking happens here, right? But... The church is not about networking. We are not here to scratch each other's back and benefit from one another. Right? We are not a fraternity. We are a fellowship of the Holy Spirit. For this reason, we must learn to be devoted to one another. Right? Not only those that we know, not only those who we happen to like or we are inclined to in some ways, 
but we are to be devoted to strangers amongst us. Right? Strangers amongst us. If we are truly devoted to God, we will be devoted to His fellowship and we will be devoted you know, to strangers and these strangers would not just be in the streets or in the concert hall or in the sanctuary, but these strangers will be in our homes. Right? We will have strangers in our homes every now and then. Verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. I, I mentioned, Luke doesn't waste words. He is very specific and intentional. When he described the church of 3,000 as meeting in the temple and then in people's what? Homes. Right? He could have said, they all met in the temple and went home. But that's not what it says in Greek. Right? He is very specific. They met in temple, they met in homes, and homes are not 3,000 you know, capacity. They are small little homes where people met. No. Here, Luke describes the reality of the church, both in a large group and in many, many, many small home groups. The large group could sing like this, could pray, could hear the sermon, but a large group can never practice the Christian faith together. You can never put it into practice. There's not enough space and time and depth to do so. Only small home groups right, could have the accountability, the accountability necessary for an authentic faith. There is no other way. Only a small group of men and women meeting regularly to renew minds, to share hearts, to challenge lives can experience the reality, the fullness, the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no other way. And our founder, John Wesley, knew it all along. He called his small groups class meetings and these class meetings revive the Anglican church and the whole of England. And you can say to some extent the whole world over the, the past 300 years. Here in Barker Road Methodist Church, we call these groups connect groups. Many of you are in one, but many more are not. Right? So this year, 2023, as uh, Pastor Wendy has declared, as the year of Connect, we are praying and working for a change. And you'll hear more of this soon in the weeks to come. And so let me wrap up the last two verses. Together, let's, let's read this. One, two, three. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is a picture of a church filled with the Spirit and devoted to the fellowship. That's why there is joy and gladness, generosity and praise. That's why the church found favour with the unchurched. And the result is the salvation of many, many souls. On the first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the disciples of Christ by wind, by fire, by tongues. This was spectacular, but this was not the substance of Pentecost. The substance was what happened afterwards when the magical experience was over and life returned to normal. The substance was more than the coming of the Spirit, but His enduring, His endearing presence in the day-to-day -day lives of the disciples for the sake of the world, for the sake of the great harvest, the Pentecost harvest. This is what church is all about, church. This is what church is all about. Authentic faith, transform lives and historical witnesses by the power of the Spirit. We live in the last days. Can you sense it? We live in the last days. 
the end is coming. Either Jesus returns or we return to him. Let us not play pretend Christians anymore. Let us not play pretend Christians or superficial church anymore. Let us be devoted to God. Let us be real, authentic in our faith, serious. Let us be devoted to one another. And let us live out a faith that everyone can see and want to be part of. And as I close, just two things to note, right, that's coming up. This year, Connect 2023, we will have a Connect campaign. Uh, we are working towards it now. Um, I'm just sharing some details to um, the key dates, like July, August, right? Eight weeks. You see the dates there? Don't take leave. Don't go away. Don't buy ticket. If you bought, just cancel. You bought insurance, right? Um, the insurance will pay back, all right? You just say that pastor said you cannot go, all right? Um, but seriously, we are looking forward to this campaign. This campaign, um, the goal, right, is to grow our connect group so that there are more connect groups for us to be part of and more of you will want to try to be in connect groups and, 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 and um, we will uh, form taster groups eight weeks so that you can experience the group life and hopefully ha having tasted it, you will want to um, continue in this fellowship of believers. Right, so we want to grow the number of groups. We also want to strengthen existing groups. We, ha we have about 80 over groups in our church, but all, not all groups are healthy and strong. Some are very social and social only. Right? Uh, some are very study and study only. Right? Um, but not really living out the faith, not really being devoted to an authentic uh, Christian community. And uh, many have also stagnated. After many, many years, it's still the same people, the same old problems, same old, you know, it's like, yeah, we're doing it out of piety, not of uh, real dynamic faith. So we want to address that in the campaign. And um, out the, there are many things in store, but one of the things that will, will the, the pastors uh, will attempt, right, to preach eight of John Wesley's most significant sermons for our times. So do pray for us. Uh, and, and, and do pray for me. I just happen to be the Connect pastor. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, I want to give you some time to do this Connect survey. It's, it's only going to take one minute, right? Um, it's just those, you know, dig, 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 dig. Um, I don't think it requires you to leave any of your contact details at all. Um, so just scan. Um, do this survey right now. I'm just going to give you one minute or one and a half. Um, and if you have a problem uh, scanning the code, you can go straight to our website. It's also in the homepage under announcements. Right? So, yeah. Just going to give you another 30 seconds to do this and then uh, we'll close. And this is really important for, for, for us um, to hear what you're saying so that we can um, grow in our devotion to God and to one another. Come, let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word given to us and, and we pray that whatever has been spoken and declared today will be received um, with hearts that are tender towards you and your truth. So help us, we pray, to not just be hearers of your word, but be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen.